los gratuitos o freemium. Entonces, eh, los dejo con Oscar. Thank you, Alejandro. I have absolutely no idea what you said. I'm sure it was very glowing. Probably too, probably too glowing. Oh, yeah, I was just, yeah, I mean, I deserve that. I really do. Um, so, um, who am I? I think you've had that. Why listen to someone like me? Well, I've been doing game stuff for a long time. Um, 98, 99, I was involved in online gaming from the point of view of uh, dial-up modems and games like Quake and Counter-Strike, uh, which is probably about 10 years too early. Um, and uh, then I worked on um, an operator called Three in the UK. I think what's interesting about Three is that uh, this is a time before we had iPhones and smartphones. It was the first 3G service. And in 2005, we did 68% of the UK downloads and plays, 45% of the revenue, and we only had 5% of the audience. Uh, I was also lucky enough to be the first person to put the first uh, Rovio game live, Darkest Fear. And seriously, it was a brilliant game, and I really hope they bring it back out again. Um, anyway, I, I've done other things. I was home architect on PlayStation Home, and I have a terrible tendency to talk too fast. And in a British accent, I understand that's more confusing for you than an American one. But please bear with me. So, um, I'm going to talk to you in a different style on a very similar theme than you've had for lots of the sessions so far. I'm going to try and paint a picture to you about the freemium model, but I'm hoping if you're a designer or if you're a developer, this is going to help you get your head into the game. This is going to help you think about playing, uh, you know, sorry, designing games, creating games that are freemium because that can make the game better, not just because you can make more money. So how, how many people want to just make games to make money? If you want to just make games to make money, can you put your hand up? Get out. <laughs> so, I mean, I, yeah, good. I, you do what I do. <laughs> I do that normally. So the point is we could all make lots more money if we were working in finance. We do games because we're passionate about it, because we love it. But the thing about this freemium world is it's a bit of a zombie apocalypse. There's a lot of change going on right now, and there are a lot of people out there who are the living dead. <laughs> so, are you making a game that's going to be 69p as a paid game? Put your hand up. You're going to make a game that's 69, sorry, a dollar. I'm thinking English here, sorry. So, are you making a game that's a dollar, that's going to be sold as a dollar on the App Store? Anyone making a game that's going to be sold as a dollar? Okay, good. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you've done that. Um, are, are you making a free-to-play game that's a copy of something someone else has done? Anyone doing basically a copycat game? Okay, that's okay. Basically, the guys who put their hands up are the living dead. If you, you know, they, they just don't know they're dead yet. And um, you know, the, the point of this thing is that I'm not actually going to tell you that there's no, no room for paid games anymore. There clearly is. Uh, I did say about a year ago that I thought there would be 12 paid games in, you know, released a year, but that was probably a bit unfair. The point about paid games versus free means it's not about the amount of money you earn necessarily, it's about the type of strategy you have of engaging with your player. If someone spends four ninety nine one time on your game, that's all you're getting if you're paying up front. If you do premium, you're still reducing access to your game and you're not getting the value out of their long-term lifetime value. So the point of this whole slide deck is to get you to think about the long-term. So, here is how we're going to survive the zombie apocalypse. First rule, cardio. Um, what this says down here, although obviously it's cut off, is if you're not agile, you may already be dead. So how many people are doing Agile development? Anyone not, actually, stuff before that, how many of you don't know what Agile development means? Is anyone there who doesn't understand the term Agile development? Okay, great. So you guys need to look this up. So it's a different way of approaching the way that you come around creating content. Rather than planning everything in advance in terms of step by step by step by step by step, what you want to do is rethink the way you approach development. Think about your game in terms of what are the most important things that I want to create. And then prioritize that. Do that from the top to the bottom. Try and get some data, try and get some information. But if you're building a minimum viable product, you've got to make some 
judgments about what's the most important thing that can convey your game. And then time box that. Develop what you can quickly and efficiently, and then get that live. Because what a minimum viable product is about, you've probably heard the term minimum viable product about 20 times today, but the minimum viable product is, a, is an experiment. It's saying, I think this is a good game, what does the market think? And we can reduce the risk, we can reduce the number of times we will fail by just thinking ahead, looking at what information we can find, and then testing what we've learned. And then keep testing and building and building. This is key to thinking like a freemium developer. Because it's saying, I'm not building a product and throwing it away, and just hoping. Think about the old days. I have a console game. I do a gold master disc. It's going to print, you know, 100,000 copies, a million copies, 10 million copies, real physical goods that go to retail shops. You can't recall that. Once it's done, it's done. But we're not in that world anymore. We get our game done, and we experiment, and we evolve, and we improve, and we keep building. This is actually about building services. So let's be agile. Let's think ahead, and let's basically be willing to pivot and change. Let's also not be sentimental. How many people don't like freemium games? Anyone not like freemium games? One of the, anyone who thinks freemium is evil? Say, freemium is evil. Okay, you go, yeah. <laughs> You're a bad boy. Um, but the, the point is, we should stop being sentimental. Freemium is not evil. We are not manipulating people here. We are creating circumstances that will encourage people to come back and play our games time and time again. And it's a game model which is based around the vast majority Somewhere between, um, it, it, let's take an example. So a typical social freemium, sorry, a typical freemium game with no social elements will probably have about 3% of people paying. A, a, a typical freemium game with social elements will probably have something like 10% um, paying, so 90% not paying. So we're in, a, we're in a model which is actually designed to encourage as many people to play your game as possible. If you really want to make art, if you really want to make games that people will remember and actually talk about, well, actually, why restrict access to your game? I'm not suggesting every freemium game does this properly. I'm merely suggesting, if we think like a freemium developer, we can actually do more interesting things. And that's why I'm trying to do these kind of presentations, to get you think, not like a zombie, not mindlessly producing things just because of their commercial value, but to actually start thinking like a living survivor who's going to create what's going to be important for the next generation of gaming. And to do that, we've got to enjoy the small things. We've got to keep the core playable mechanic simple and easy and accessible. And it's got to be repeatable. I'm going to have to play this game for, well, I won't get into the dates, we'll cut that come later, but I've got to keep playing this game for a long period of time if you're going to get the best value out of me. Um, I've forgotten who said it earlier on, but the idea of uh, lifetime value. Lifetime value is really important. Now, do you think 30 days is a long time for a lifetime value of a game? I don't. 100 days is probably closer to what we should be trying to get out of our best players. Because if we can't create an experience that they love and are passionate about, then we're going to have to basically sell something essentially not so good. And what I want to do is create better games that invest in the experience, invest in the gamers, and show them a bit of love, to be honest. And then we can keep them playing. So we have to concentrate on the small things, get the mechanics right. But we also have to check the back seats. So what do I mean by that? Well, you've got to learn not just from your own failures. Uh, and we saw some um, examples earlier on about learning from other games. App Honey, again, I can't reinforce how good that is as a service, and Flurry and various others do very similar things. News is also a good one to get some data on, but App Honey is very good to look at specific games. Let's learn from what other games have done and try and absorb not what they did specifically, but the psychology of the effect it has on the player. We're going to stop thinking about what designs we admire and start thinking about how we can build trust and, and passion amongst our players. And to do that, we've actually got to look at what people have done right and what people have done wrong and experiment within 
that kind of knowledge base and, and not be, basically not be timid about it, but at the same time not do the same thing that everybody else has done just because they have. It's uh, Albert Einstein's definition of insanity was doing the same thing on and on again and expecting a different result. We've also got to check the exits. Uh, I know it's going to come as a surprise to you, but players don't play your game forever. Even if we get them to play for 100 days, most of them won't stay. So you have to understand why people are churning. That's why this sort of funnel analysis data is so important. We need to know exactly what are the intentions of the player and when they leave, and then we can try and understand how we can make the game better. We don't just want to lock them into our game like some sort of cynical, diabolical genius. We actually want them to love our game and keep playing our game because of the passion they have for it. So to do that, we have to understand what's annoying them, what's pissing them off that makes them leave. Well, if we can understand that and help keep them wanting to play, then we're going to have a much better time of it. And uh, in this world of zombies, bites are infectious. So don't ignore the social factors. So we, uh, we, with field runners, there was a conversation about permanent weapon upgrades. And uh, one of the key things I've seen time and time again in lots of games is the difference that when you start showing people what you've bought has on your income. Like I said earlier, a social freemium game will typically get something like 10% people paying. A non-social freemium game will typically get 3%. The effect of showing your friends what you do is incredibly important. There's a principle called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. In fact, in a different slide deck, I'd call it Oscar's Hierarchy of Games, but that's because I'm sort of stealing things. But if you think about the, the idea, so the base level of a game is entertain me. But then I've got to trust you if I'm going to pass over my cash. So I've got to feel safe. Then I've got to feel like I'm not the only person who likes this game. And until I've got past those stages, I can't then want to show off, which is the motivation in quite a lot of cases for people to make their first purchase. It's not always the case, but it is often a good motivator. And then the final stage actually gets to kind of antisocial, which is where we get these the sort of whale buyers as we keep hearing about. The whales are really important because they, they get to a sort of mindset in playing your game where it becomes more important that they maximise how good they are at that game. And that ability to sort of uh, go into themselves and really maximise their own ability playing your game matters to helping understanding what the, male, the whale behaviour is. But don't hunt whales. And I'll, I'm not sure I'm going to get into that in this slide deck, but whales is a bad thing to target because whales aren't typical of your behaviour. You're actually probably better off looking at the way people share. Um, and I, if you want to talk about that at another time, there's another presentation I do on that. But look at sharers, not whales. And um, obviously, if we've got nasty zombies around, we need to double tap. Uh, we don't want to just kind of uh, wound them because they're going to keep coming. We need to make sure that we've got them properly. Uh, okay, it's a joke, but um, we, we heard again earlier the idea of, of these consumable goods and these permanent goods. I'd like to sort of twist that slightly. And um, what, what I've seen more often than not is that consumables often drive the revenue, um, but the durables drive the trust. So the kinds of durable goods that I'm talking about aren't necessarily a weapon upgrade. A weapon upgrade's not a bad one, but as we heard before, once you've bought it, you've upgraded your weapon. So what? Well, let's take a different example. What if the permanent thing you buy is giving you something consumable on a regular basis? So let's take the now a more or less defunct idea of energy. So, you know, the fuel in your car in CSR racing or, or the number of bullets you've got in a, in a shooting game. And let's say I get, say, 10, you know, energy crystals a day normally just to keep me playing the game. Well, if I buy the well of energy crystals for one ninety nine, and that gives me 20 more energy crystals every day, provided I come back and get it, now, that's built utility into the game. Utility is another economics concept, the idea that I've invested in something. Most of the consumable goods we create don't leave the players feeling like they've invested in the game because they get the life-saving health potion. They use it, and it's gone. 
But if they have an alchemist that they recruit in the game, who gives them 10 health potions every day, provided they go and collect them, then they've got a reason to have to go back to the game to be able to get the value that they've already invested in. And this is kind of the point of what I'm talking about with this double tap idea. Let's not just throw out a few things that people might buy. Let's actually think about the psychology of what's going to keep them playing the game. Let's build utility into the experience. But let's use ammo sparingly. Because if I spend money, the first time is uh, you know, the most critical point. Uh, it's it's a, a transition point. I, I call it the sort of transition between the learning stage of a player, where they're kind of trying to work out where the game fits in their experience, to the uh, engaging point in the game, where they become a repeat player. And there's something about this stage where making that first purchase matters. So that's about almost like starting a fire, a desire. You've got to provide the oxygen, you've got to provide the fuel and the spark. You're making a sale, you're being the retailer. You've got to provide the spark that makes people feel good about spending that first dollar, that first um, good. And so let's, let's think very carefully how we communicate that first sale. And they keep coming. The zombies are coming. Um, so your compulsion loop has to maintain interest over an extended period of time. So when they start spending money, they, that, that compulsion loop doesn't just sit statically. You add more choices. We don't want to just cut out the value of playing the game by adding goods. So one of the things I find fr most frustrating, let's take a game like CSR Racing, a great game. But by the time I got to the third tier of playing, I realized that the performance metric, the thing that kept me playing, the thing that let me know how good at, I was at playing the game, was how much money I was earning by playing. Why would I ever spend any money on consumable goods to buy coins ever again? Once I know that the thing that lets me measure how well I'm doing is the currency, why would I buy currency? So don't make the things that you sell the things that help the players measure their own performance. Think carefully about the shadow that every good that you have has on the player behavior. Because we want them to keep coming again and again and again and again. But of course, complacency kills. And one thing I've noticed when I've done this presentation in lots of different places is that every single time I do it, some of the messages change, some of the messages evolve. We're actually in an incredible moment where we don't know what the answer is. And in fact, every time a new game comes out with a new twist in the, mobile, in the mechanics, uh, a new approach to the way the devices work, I mean, we've got, we've got so much change going on. We've got the unconsoles, the devices which are basically like phone, tablet type things, but they're sat under a telly rather than in our hands. We've got the PS4s, the Xbox, you know, I, I can't decide whether to call it the Xbox 180 because they keep changing their mind or the X-Bone, um, but anyway, there's lots of sort of silly ways of looking at it. There's so much going on. If we just assume we know everything, we're dead, we're the zombies. In fact, actually we need to start innovating and, and always looking at what changes, always what matters, because we need to put the player at the heart of the experience. Actually, the technology is almost irrelevant, but we need to understand what is driving player interest and make sure that they see value in what we do, and they want to come back and do it. Of course, we have to count our bullets. And data, like I'm sure you've heard this lots of times, data is vital, vital, vital. Um, one of the biggest difficulties I had when I joined PlayStation Home was trying to explain to the team that we needed to capture player data. In fact, I had to actually do a little bit of a political deal to get rid of some one team and get another team to do the work for me, despite the internal uh, production developers. And of course, once they saw the data, everything changed. Ah, so that's why they're not you know, carrying on past the... I don't know if you know PlayStation Home, but we originally launched into an apartment and there was no sign to tell you that there were other things. And we had loads of people sitting there in the apartment going, well, this isn't fun. Because <laughs> we thought, when we designed it, everybody would want to see their apartment before they went out so they'd feel safe. Wrong. You know, so learn, and you only learn by getting the data, and you only learn by making sure you ask the right questions. Actually, really important thing, asking the right questions is vital, because most people don't know what the questions they need to ask are. 
And quite a lot of people make lots of very bad decisions by not understanding what the data actually means. So all of this comes to the point where we realize that all things will pass. Games, products have life cycles. They don't last forever. But players have life cycles too. And if we're going to make the best possible game, we have to take into account that the attitudes and behaviors of a player change from the point where they first download your game. I call that discovering. They have certain needs, certain uh, conditions they need to be satisfied for them to be able to continue with your game. So the discoverers, you've got to find why they're going to install. The next stage, having installed, is the learning stage, where they're trying to work out how well this game fits with their lifestyle, whether they enjoy it, whether the mechanics work for them, and whether they want to spend any money in it. The learning stage um, transitions to engaging, when they're going to be repeat players, they're kind of committed, and they've got they schedule time to play your game. And that's a different life stage. Has different needs, has different attitudes. You don't want to get your learning players to spam their friends on Facebook because it's just going to piss them off and their friends. Instead, you want to find ways to make the engaging players feel good about showing off why this game matters to them. Thinking about your player in life stages makes a huge difference. And also, um, it's worth bearing in mind that it takes time before these transitions happen. And we talked about the whale before. Uh, some data we got from Papaya Mobile when I was working there. Uh, we looked at the games that were social freemium, we looked at the freemium games, and we looked at the, the, the games that were paid that we had on the platform. And we saw that there was a pattern that was fairly consistent, which is that the guys who spent $100 a month or more were the people who had been playing the game at least eight days and no more than 12 days. That time period between eight and 12 days made a huge difference to identifying the people who are most likely to spend $100 a month or more on the game. I'm not saying you should try and get $100 a, a, you know, a month out of every player at all. That's just a metric that happened to apply to that particular game. You know, there are some people who think that that's an evil act because you want to get all, the much, all that much money out of people. I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm not saying they're right. Just think about how much people spend on their hobby. How much money do you spend on your hobby every month? And if this game, if your game becomes that player's hobby, and they want to spend money on it, we need to be able to provide value for them that makes that feel like a good thing to do. We shouldn't be cynical about it. We should make sure that we're delivering value. But let's think about that time, that time frame. It takes time to turn. And I honestly believe that if you're making a premium game, if you're making a premium game, you're eventually going to work out the economy of a freemium game makes so much more difference. I'll give you an example. It typically takes something like 3,500 downloads per day to be in the paid chart, in the top 25 of the paid chart. It takes 35,000 downloads per day to be in the free chart. There's two ways of looking at that. Oh, it's difficult to get in the in the free chart. That's true, discovery is an issue, but that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that the willingness of people to get past the barrier of downloading is at least 10 times per day for a, compared to a paid game. Think about that. If, if, if I'm right, if my hypothesis is right, and go out there and check it for yourself, if I'm, my hypothesis is right, the willingness to go get a free game and install it is 10 times per day what it is for a paid one. I, mean, I repeated that for a reason. I wanted you to bear that in mind. It's an exponential difference. When you buy a game, it has an impact on your attitudes and behaviors. You have to have enough anticipation and excitement to get you past the point of doing the process of not only downloading the game, but also to spend the money on it. And that level of excitement is quite big quite exciting. It's always going to have to be more than the reality of what your game will deliver. And then you drop down into this pit of disillusionment, they call it. And it's a, there's a great curve called the hype curve. It's worth looking at. That means that when we face with the reality of a game, you're always a little disappointed. And you have to build yourself back up again to the point where you feel comfortable and, and satisfied. And a lot of people who are looking at paid games, particularly people who look at content-based, like level downloads or or um, episodic content, 
A lot of people forget this idea of there's this disappointment that happens after you make a purchase. If we're going to get people to keep being engaged with our games, we have to think about how we engage them continually. And that's what I call the Freeman model that may be different from other people's definition of it. So that was the zombie apocalypse, and hopefully I've given you a few survival tips. Um, so you know who I am and, and what I do in, in my kind of professional life at the moment. Uh, Amplifier is a service that does gameplay recording. It's a free SDK. Uh, you could put it into your game. It's iOS only at the moment, but we are working on an Android version. Uh, it's got a Unity plugin. It's got a, a UDK plugin, uh, Cocos. Um, I use this example. I don't know if anyone knows Secret Exit and the game Stair Dismount. It's a great, fun little game. They were one of the first games we had. They had 10,000 videos uploaded from players in the first um, month. Uh, and from that, they generated, you know, half of them were shared on Facebook, some of them were shared on YouTube, some of them were shared on Twitter. Um, from that, they saw 15% of, sorry, uh, engage brain. They saw that for every Facebook share, they had 15 people that watched the video. And then 12% of them went to download that. Now that sounds all right. And then we had um, NimbleQuest come out. NimbleQuest got 10,000 videos uploaded in the first week, not in the first month, so it was much quicker. They saw 20 views for every Facebook share. And then 20% of people went to download the game. And we thought that was good. And then Bad Piggies launched. You know Bad Piggies, the uh, Robbie game? Uh, they had uh, 10,000 videos uploaded in the first day, which is quite nice, uh, and 40 people watched um, each of the Facebook shared videos, and then 20% of them went to download it. So it's a free service, and so on and so forth. Um, we also do gameplay ads. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a bit cheeky. I don't know how much time I've got. I'm going to be a bit cheeky. I'm going to do a live demo. And uh, so bear with me if this screws up. But hang on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into a game. It's actually the... Uh, if you've used Unity, you'll, you'll recognize the game. It's the um, Angry Bot. It's a default sort of project which we, everybody uses. And we just use it because it's familiar. But it has a nice little twist. And you'll, you'll notice as I start playing it. So uh, I'll just do, put the mic down and do that. Come and see me and I'll show you it later. Um, oh, what a shame. How disappointing. We need projectors that do full screen, clearly. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, I have to thank these people. Um, uh, there's my mum, my daughter, uh, lots of my friends, my wife. Um, so, lots of my friends uh, help me out. We've done a few of these photo shoots. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and Kate in the middle here is next um, pro production. Uh, hence why some of the makeup's really good. Um, so I have to thank those guys, they, they're great fun, and uh, we had a great, a great laugh doing it. The reason for doing this is I'm fed up with doing boring presentations, so I hope you enjoy them. Like it. Um, you can't see there my, my Twitter tag or my... Anyway, so if you want to find out about me, I can give you a business card, I can talk on almost every subject related to games, and often do. You can check out my articles in uh, the Gamer in particular as well, and I'm currently... I should use the mic, shouldn't I? Uh, so I'm getting told off in the back. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm currently working on a book called Games of the Service, How Free-to-Play Design Can Make Better Games. So without further ado, if you have any questions, any thoughts, uh, please feel free to talk. Does anyone have any questions for me? Don't be shy, I only bite. But I'm not a zombie yet. There must be some burgeoning questions out there. Oh, there's one here. Where do you get the numbers? The numbers for the which one? The um, eight to twelve days. 
Okay, so the 10%, 3% came from, um, again, this is when I was working at Papaya, we did a lot of research on, uh, on the relative uh, sales and relative income from different games. And so it was a headline figure that came from that. But I've also looked back and compared it with uh, people at Flurry and New Zoo and various others. So um, it's hard to give you a kind of particular quote because it was taken from a particular work that we did whilst I was at Papaya, which wasn't released publicly, so I can't give you a, a link to show it. So I'm going to have to ask you to trust me. <laughs> I mean, that's a really bad thing to say, but yeah, that, that's unfortunately I can't give you a, a evidence of that at the moment. Uh, yeah, so you can look at the EveryPlay blog. I'm currently um, uh, in the process of building a website around the book I'm, I'm working on, but that's not there yet. Uh, but just check out Pocket Gamer. The, Pocketgamer.biz is a, a great site for finding lots of uh, articles from people like me, people who disagree with me, which is also good. Um, you know, I'm not right. I'm just more right than most people. <laughs> I know, it's terribly arrogant, but hey. Any more questions? Have we broken the barriers or are you all done? You've all been zombied out, haven't you? Maybe, just, hungry. maybe hungry. So thank you very much for having me. It's been great to be in Colombia. Thank you, Oscar. Eh, les recuerdo, la próxima charla empieza a la 1 y 45 con Barbara hablando de pruebas de usuario. Nos vemos más tarde. <laughs>